Good morning, good morning. Welcome back to our uh, second day of Peter, but now we're going to be moving into 2 Peter. And 2 Peter is pretty short. It's only three chapters. Uh, so I think we'll, we'll start on it this week, and we'll probably finish it next week. So 2 Peter, uh, it's a, uh, uh, I just uh, called this an introduction, and we'll take out uh, the first part of chapter 1. And uh, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, oh Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord, so much for this opportunity to uh, to look into your, your word and to uh, glean a little bit more information that we can apply to our lives. Help us to uh, be able to see and to understand your word in a way that you want us to understand it. In Jesus' precious name I pray, amen. Okay, so... Didn't have much of a picture for this one, so I... Uh, Second Peter actually is heading towards his crucifixion, and this one, uh, this part, this part uh, could have been uh, actually uh, this letter could have been from Rome, because uh, we know that uh, crucifixion was the main way of uh, of uh, killing people in uh, in the Roman Empire, and that uh, in the Jerusalem, it could have happened in Jerusalem, I guess too. Uh, they crucified Jesus in Jerusalem. But that there, there is, there is at least in this particular letter, uh, some of the theologians I like to read uh, kind of think it could have happened from Rome. So I found this picture by Michelangelo uh, called "The Crucifixion of Peter," and he wanted to be crucified upside down because he did not want to uh, be crucified the same way that his Lord and Savior was. So I'll kind of use that as a backdrop for to, for this lesson. And uh, there's something else I was going to say about it. Uh, maybe it'll come to me. I can't think of it now. Anyway, let's get started. And uh, wait a minute, let me get these verses up. Okay. And so start in verse 1, Second Peter. This is, a, this is an introduction, so uh, the first part of this. Where is my verses? There they are. Okay. So... Who wrote Second Peter? Well, most people believe it was Peter, because Peter actually said he did right in the first verse. So let's start right there. Verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. I can see this too, this kind of, uh, you notice he addressed himself as Simon Peter. Remember his original name was Simon way back when he was a fisherman. So this is probably the, uh, he knew that his time was short, the time was coming about that he was going to be uh, killed. And it, uh, so he was probably reflecting in this letter, uh, his, uh, basically, uh, his history, starting out of his Simon and ending up as Peter. So the name was given to him uh, by Jesus. The date was probably about 66 AD, and at least two sources that assume it was done from Rome. Both uh, Schofield and uh, and Thomas Nelson both said the same thing. And this is what Nelson wrote. This epistle was written just before the apostle's death. And we see this uh, in, in verse 14 of chapter 1. Knowing that surely I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. And, and, and this is why I support the idea that he was definitely crucified. Uh, is because of the way Jesus actually predicted it way back in John, uh, up there near the Sea of Galilee, remember before his ascension, and that was in uh, John 21, 18 and 19, is where he said it, this is Jesus speaking, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou was young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest where thou wouldest, but when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, i.e. crucifixion, and another shall gird thee, okay, nailed him to the cross, 
and carry thee whether thou wouldest not. No, he's, uh, he's not. Uh, he's not going someplace he wants to go. Probably originated from Rome, Peter's martyrdom took place between 64, I mean 64 and 66 A.D. And they base that on the fact that if Peter were alive in 67 A.D., when Paul wrote 2 Timothy, during his second Roman imprisonment, it's most, it is likely that Paul would have mentioned him. So I think that Peter was already gone by then. Interesting thing, 2 Peter and 2 Timothy, which is the, is the last letter that uh, Paul wrote, are very similar, have much in common, and both the writers are aware that martyrdom is near. Let's look at the comparison. Oh, let me finish John. I forgot to... Verse 19 on, on John. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto him, follow me. Uh, so it actually confirms uh, that uh, what Jesus was talking about there is the way Peter was going to die. Okay. Back to my comparison of Timothy and Peter. So in 2 Timothy 4, 6, For I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. That was Paul. And then uh, 2 Peter 1, 14, we just read, knowing that shortly I must put off this, my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. So both are singularly sustained and, jo and joyful. Both foresee the apostasy in which the history of the professing church will end. Paul finds that apostasy in his last stage, when the so-called laity have become infected. And we, uh, we talk, I'm going to talk about the, the laity again in that uh, definition of Nickelodeons that I mentioned in our Wednesday study. And I'm just going to review that again after I finish this paragraph. But the laity had become infected. And we see this in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, hardy, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, for such turn away. And then going to... Uh, Continuing in this train of thought, going to 2 Timothy 4.3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itchy ears. This is talking about false uh, teachers, which we'll get into in, uh, in uh, Peter too. And also 2 Timothy 4.4. 4. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. So Peter traces the origin of the apostasy uh, to false teachers also. We'll see this when we get to 2 Peter 2, 1 through 3. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them, and bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their precursious ways by reason of whom they the way of truth shall be evilly spoken of. And, and through covetousness shall they with feign words like make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. So we'll get into that more in the chapter 2. Jump into verses 15 through 19. Which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bozar, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Remember, way back in our uh, numbers study, we talked about Balaam quite a bit. And I'm sure I'll kind of bring him up again when we get to that part. But was rebuked by his, for his iniquity. The, the dumb ass speaking with a man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. But when to speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure their lust of the flesh, uh, though much wantonness. Those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. While they promise their liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for of 
for of whom a man is overcome of the same as he brought into bondage. So again, that's talking about false teachers, and we'll get into that in chapter 2. So in Peter, the false teachers deny redemption truth. We said that in 2 Peter 2, 1. But there were false prophets also among the people. So we shall find in 1 John a deeper depth denial of the truth concerning Christ's personage. 1 John 4, 1 through 5. Getting a sense here that all these, all the apostles that were left during this particular period of time were seeing the same thing. A kind of great proof of what was happening in that time frame of the mid-first century. Speaking of John here in uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye that the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. And uh, we're not studying First John, but that gives you an idea what we're talking about. In Jude also, uh, all, all phases of the apostasy are also seen. But in none of these epistles is, there, is the tone of dejection or pessimism God and his promises are st still the resource of the believer. And speaking of the laity, we have the Nicolaitans. Now, these are people had a, had a uh, it, it's, it's talked about by Jesus in the uh, seven letters, particularly in uh, uh, prior to Thyatira and Pergamum. And it's also mentioned in Ephesus as uh, that they recognize those Nicolaitans and refuse and, and, and uh, don't listen to them. By the time you get to Pergamon, uh, they are they are be, they are becoming part of the doctrine of the church, and they uh, manifest themselves going into the uh, uh, Thyatira, which we just talked about Wednesday. So these Nicolaitans are actually people that, that, that from the and from Nico means to conquer Nico, and Laos the people or laity is uh, what Nicolaitans talks about. So to conquer the people. There is no ancient authority for the sect of the Nicodonians. They can't find a definite proof of this group. But they see the uh, the act, the people acting like this. Uh, and that would be, uh, you can definitely see it in the church of Thyatira. If the word is symbolic, it refers to the earliest form of the notion of a priestly order or clergy, which later divided an equal, uh, equal brotherhood. We see this a lot in churches where the, uh, the, uh, the, the pastor basically has control of the people or the priest. And it's particularly apparent in the Catholic Church, uh, where if you ask the average Catholic, they believe that what the Pope says is law. Uh, there was actually a period of time during the, uh, during the uh, uh, what was that called? Uh, the, uh, that's when an I, I always get this word, the insurrection, uh, I think it's actually not even called insurrection, but it's when the Catholic Church was killing anyone who was not a member of the church, of the Catholic Church. It was during the Middle Ages, uh, like leading up to a thousand AD period of time. And, the, and the, uh, the predominant church was the Catholic Church. It was married to the uh, government. So basically it was like a combination of the, uh, of the government and the church combining and that's called, and they call it the marriage of the, uh, mar the, the married church to the to the uh, to the world. It started. It was it was taking pagan principles and applying them to Christianity, and trying to make them work together. That's where a lot of our things like uh, the Christmas tree came from. Believe it or not, uh, that comes from a, that actually comes from a false god. I always forget the whole story, but basically they used to burn a log. They called a Yule log uh, the day before, and that uh, on the winter solstice, which is in December, uh, the next morning it would turn into a big, beautiful tree. 
uh, and that uh, this was uh, this was a festival that was held according to some uh, some god. That's just one example. There's a bunch of them, but that that's an example of how they tried to marry these pagan rituals to the church, and that's what the Nickelodeons uh, were the people in charge of that. So Jesus in in the letters to the seven churches actually mentions that he hates the Nickelodeons or people that act like in the, uh, this this sect. So that's what I'm talking about here. So we go to Matthew 23, 8. This is Jesus speaking. But be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all are your brethren. This is speaking to the fact that uh, the only person we should, we, we should have control of over us is Jesus Christ. No man uh, when it comes to the church. Into priest and laity. So what in Ephesus was deeds, and we see that in Revelation 2.6. This is Jesus again speaking. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate, had become in Pergamus a doctrine, as I mentioned in Revelation 2.15. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which, oh, which thing I hate. That was the, the early stages of the church marrying the, uh, the, the, uh, the world. And it was actually at a point where the popes were actually being appointed by government leaders. So in order, to, uh, so basically that the uh, the popes were actually controlled by the government, and the popes were trying to gain more and more power over the people. So that was the starting of it. So continuing, so the Nickelodeons. Uh, so comparing First Peter five two and three. We can see that this is definitely not the way that God sees things. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, so that the so the people, uh, the pastors and leaders of the church should be should be should take oversight, not by constraint. So it should be it shouldn't be forced. It shouldn't be a requirement, but willingly, not and not for money, but of a ready mind. Verse 3, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. If you remember when Jesus said to Peter, you'll understand what I'm doing later, is when Jesus, as God, believe, in, uh, believe this, washed the disciples' feet. And that was the idea, is that uh, it's about serving one another, and it's not about controlling one another. And we saw that in Matthew 24, 49. And shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunkard. I think I grabbed the wrong verse there. No, that's the right one. I'm not sure why that one was there. I think it's talking about, again, talking about these people, these lords that were servants. Uh, you shouldn't, in other words, you shouldn't be doing it with some kind of a power. Uh, I was smiting your fellow servants. So this is basically what the, what the Catholic Church was doing then during the insurrection. How was it they were killing anyone who didn't follow the doctrine of the Catholic Church? And I brought up a chart when I, I did it Wednesday of what they call the Trail of Blood uh, and, and, the, and the differences between the true church that came out of the apostles and all these uh, other churches that came about uh, during the Middle Ages. Okay, so... So this uh, this book uh, this uh, this book is broken up into four sections. Uh, the first one being the great Christian virtues, and that's what we're going to talk about today, uh, verses uh, chapter one, verses one through fourteen. Then the scriptures will be exalted. That'll be uh, in verses fifteen through twenty-one in chapter one. In chapter two, the whole thing, warnings about apostate teachers. That's what I was talking about. The comparison with with Second Timothy. And with First John, and then the second coming of Christ is the third chapter, and the day of Jehovah is the third chapter. So, as Peter's condemnation of the false teachers describes the immoral lifestyle, the futility and destruction of their teachings, and the certainty of their destruction and judgment by God. So, Peter's focus on the coming day of the Lord was apparently prompted by false teachers' denial that divine judgment would ever come. 
In other words, that the, the, the day of the Lord would never come. So they're basically saying that uh, uh, teaching a false doctrine. In light of the coming day of the Lord, Peter exhausts his readers to live lives of holiness, steadfastness, and growth. So let's dig in a little bit. Uh, and uh, that was my introduction. And we just take the first 14 verses here. We'll see how far we get in the next 10 minutes or so. Verse 1, 2 Peter. Simon Peter, a servant and, and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. I might mention here that servant, uh, another word for it would be bondman, which in this time period was a slave who loved his master so much and uh, became a permanent servant to him. They would actually take an awl and they would punch a hole in the ear and attach an earring. And that would, that would show ownership of that uh, slave to the master. And, that's a, and we are bondmen to Jesus Christ. That's a basically uh, where that term comes from. And speaking of a servant, go into John 12, 26. If, a man, if any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, then shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. That was Jesus speaking. Also in Romans 1, 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. The same idea of a servant, a servant to the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, back to Peter. Verse 2, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of, our, of Jesus our Lord, accordingly as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. So life, life, eternal, and what it's speaking to is eternal life. Some other verse than that, 1 John 1, 1 and 2. That's what, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us, given to us. Jump to Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. I love this, this verse. I got a nice picture of this uh, that really signifies this. Let me get it so you can get a really good symbolic of this. Uh, I really like this picture. If I can find it real quick. Let's see, I was using it in... Uh, I'm not going to be able to remember which one I was using it in. I was in Matthew. <laughs> Duh. Matthew, where are you? Uh, maybe I don't have it in here. Okay, I'm not sure where I have it. Oh, well, maybe we'll get it tomorrow. Okay. Anyways, uh, back to our thing here. Anyways, uh, enter into the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go there into. Verse 14. But straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. I guess remembered where it's at. <laughs> I have this. Uh, How to get to heaven is the picture. Uh, 
There it is there. So narrow is the gate that leads the, leads to Christ. Wide is the gate, highway at 75 miles an hour, directly into the lake of fire. So I'll, be, I'll leave that up there for a second. Because that's, uh, that's where most people are going, down that super highway. Okay, so where was I? And also in Revelation 22, 19. If any man shall take away from the words of this book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So talk about life eternal, but that's how you can lose it. Okay, on to verse 4. Whereby are given unto us exceedingly great and precious promises, that by these you shall be partakers of divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So partakers, partakers of the divine nature. So jump into Hebrews 12, 10 and 11. For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous nevertheless. Afterward it yieldeth a peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. I can always I can guarantee every single time that the, the Lord God has had to <clears throat> take me to the woodshed, as they say, I deserved it, every bit of it. And usually afterwards I realized that I needed it. And so I, I praise God for it. And that's what he's that's what uh, Paul's talking about here. <clears throat> <clears throat> And to escape corruption, 2 Peter 2, 18 through 20. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure their lust through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that are clean escape from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same as he brought in bondage. For if all they had... For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. So that when they go back to their ways, typically it gets worse and worse. It's like a cycle, like our judges study almost, <clears throat> where every, every time you uh, go back to your old ways and then try to recoup, uh, you end up uh, in a worse place. Uh, when you try, try to go back, in other words. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> That's interesting. I put Second Peter 2.20 in there three or four times. I had my, my little thing. Anyways, now to verse 5 through 8. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to your virtual knowledge, to your knowledge temperance, and to your temperance patience, and to your patience godliness, and to godliness brother kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. Remember, and I always try to remember, charity actually means love. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That, that word barren actually is talking about being idle. Okay, verse 9. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Remember, when we accept the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, uh, that, that we are purged of our old sins. It doesn't mean our sin nature has, has stopped, but in our, in our quest to be more like Jesus, uh, we try to, to avoid being in situations that causes us to get back into our sin nature. So that's what we mean by uh, lacking these things, uh, things is blind. We cannot see afar off. We can't see that we're, uh, when we're heading back into our own destruction. 1 John 2, 9 through 11 speaks of this too. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. 
But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because the darkness hath blinded his eyes. That's the that idea of being blinded. So the ultimate goal is to, is to get more and more like Jesus. Remember, Jesus never sinned. And so that he didn't com commit any of these sins. He didn't have a sin nature. And we feel you should be striving for a sin, uh, sinless nature also. Okay. Now verse 10. Wherefore, the rather brethren, giving diligence to making your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fa fall. Your calling, that's whatever God has put in, uh, put in your heart to be, uh, to be your ministry, your, your, uh, your, uh, the thing that the Lord uh, has, uh, has put aside for you to do. Make your calling sure. We'll go to 1 John 3, 19 through 21. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemneth us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Belie uh, beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have have we confidence towards God. Basically, when we are in tune with our calling, our hearts will uh, will be sure. Okay, just finishing up here. I think we're a little over time, but I'll just finish this part. Yeah, we're not we're not too bad. Verse 11, for so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Therefore, I mean, now wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them and be established in your present truth. Yea, yea, I think it's it's meet as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. Tabernacle is always talking about our human body, our, our flesh, uh, and uh, and, I will, and uh, to stir uh, to stir us up. Uh, we look to Second Peter three one and two. This second epistle, beloved, I will write. I now write unto you in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. To reflection, I say my idea of the Simon and the Peter, the uh, uh, bookends, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. <clears throat> so as verse for today, verse 14, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. He knows his departure is soon and putting off his tabernacle. In other words, i.e. death. Uh, let's look at Revelation 6, 9 through 10. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God, for the testimony which they held. Now uh, we can see that, uh, they, that we see in heaven uh, these particular souls that actually did, uh, for the word of God, uh, were slain. And, we, and that's no different with Peter. Even though Peter won't be this, you know, here in this, this is reflecting on those that actually, uh, his fifth seal ones are the ones that actually happened during the tribulation. But it's the same idea. <clears throat> Verse 10. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, does thou not judge and avenge our blood to them that dwell on the earth? And it goes on to say in that one, that the, the Lord tells them, just wait a little while longer until the rest of your fellow uh, martyrs are also come come up. Also Genesis 3.19. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So that's when we put away our tabernacle. So when we return to the dust of the earth. We we'll get a new body though. And I'm going to go through that in a minute. Hebrews 9.27 As he is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Except, uh, except there are a few, uh, some, somebody someday is going to be, uh, is going to go directly to heaven without going through death. And I picked the 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 8 example of the, uh, of putting off this old body and putting on a new tabernacle that the Lord is going to give us during the rapture. 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 8. 
For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. But in, for in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so, being that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For if... For we that are in the tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for the, that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Amen for that. I'm reminded, though, that, that tabernacle as used in the rapture, though, uh, that's a little bit different tabernacle. The new one we're going to get, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 57, and we'll end with this. Beautiful note. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we all shall be changed. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. For this mortal must put on immortality. I'll live forever. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O death, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which gave us, us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen to that. So that is, uh, that's the uh, start of Second Peter, and we'll get into this more next week. I hope that was a blessing to you. I know it was for me. And so... Uh, but the weekend is upon us again, and so I hope you have a great weekend. And again, if you happen to be in the Cass I mean, in the uh, Coolidge, Florence area, on Sunday, please join us at our church at uh, the church I attend, Fairhaven Baptist Church, uh, in uh, it's on Highway 287, and in between Florence and Coolidge. It's actually physically in Coolidge, uh, but it's in between uh, Florence and Coolidge, about equal distance. So I hope to see you there, and we'll uh, talk again next week. We'll be back on Monday into Judges, and we'll see you then.